Good morning and welcome to the second webinar of the year, the second webinar that we are organizing as a Europe Direct Core platform. Uh, this year, our webinars are focusing on Malta's recovery and resilience plan, a topic which we uh, discussed during one of our webinars last year. And this year, we'll be looking at the different aspects of the recovery and resilience plan today. We will be focusing on the components relating to health. And in fact, the topic of today's webinar is strengthening the resilience of the health system. And once again, to share uh, their knowledge and their expertise on the topic, we have with us um, a very esteemed panel of guests. Um, I would like to welcome Ms. Laura Peter, who is a policy officer within the DG Sante at the European Commission. Also with us is Mr. Ben Rizzo from the European Economic and Social Committee. We also have Dr. Chris De Guara today representing the Malta Chamber of Commerce, Enterprise and Industry. Dr. Anthony Gatt, who is a consultant public health medicine within the office of the chief medical officer in the Department for Policy in Health. And last but not least, we also have Ms. Helga Elul, who is the president of Core Platform, which is the host institution of our Europe Direct Center. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And I would like to invite you, Helga to start off with your introductory remarks. Well, good morning to you all. As uh, Roberta already outlined, the work of our Europe Direct core platform is to inform the citizen out in Malta here about European programs and initiatives that have an impact on their lives and on their businesses. As part of these activities, initiatives, Europe Direct Core Platform is organizing these various webinars and they are focusing on Malta's recovery and resilient plan. Now we had the first webinar held in the last quarter of 2021, which provided actually a detailed overview, overview of the plan. And this year's webinars now will be focusing uh, into each of the six pillars of the plan in further details to see what's actually happening. Malta's plan is based on six main components. Now, our first webinar, which was held on the 16th of March, was titled Fostering a Digital, Smart and Resilient Economy. But today we are focusing on component number four, which is strengthening the resilience of the health system. In 2019, the Council's recommendations on, the, on our national reform program of Malta stated actually regarding healthcare measures to decentralize services from hospitals to primary care and to improve the provision of long-term care services are ongoing. The current plans to expand the capacity of public hospital outpatient care, care can help in tackling the long waiting times for certain specialities. But nevertheless, other measures to reduce unnecessary referrals to specialists and redirect inappropriate use of emergency care to our patients have so far not been fully used, so as preventing actually improvements in efficiency of the system. A new concept for primary care centers and investments to gradually expand the use of health are carried out with a view of to decentralize the service from hospitals to primary care level. Reflecting increased demand for long-term care, new types of community-based and home care services were introduced in 2017 to 2018. But despite the potential, the impact of the measures in this area of pensions and healthcare on fiscal sustainability has yet to materialize. In 2020 recommendations, on the other hand, it states the following. The Maltese health healthcare system delivers good health outcomes. However, the outbreak of the pandemic put the Maltese public health system under unprecedented levels of pressure. Efforts to focus on building, on building the capacity of the healthcare systems to respond effectively to the pandemic crisis 
would improve its resilience. Now, the following areas require particular monitoring. The increasing reliance on migrant nurses in acute and long-term care and an aging private general practitioners workforce may pose challenges. The difficulties in making new and innovative medicines available. The high out-of-pocket expenditure on primary and outpatient care and on some medicines. Waiting lists for outpatient care specialities are consistently long and have been increasing recently. Reorientating service delivery away from hospitals to primary care remains also a key priority. The, the 2019 recommendations therefore included in the earlier ensuring the fiscal sustainability of the healthcare system, where the 2020 recommendation focused around strengthening the resilience of the health system with regard to the health workforce, critical medical products, and primary care. The reforms and investments being proposed under the Malta recovery um, plan reflect this recommendation. So I'm looking really forward to a fruitful discussion to fully understand the reforms and investments underway, and also how the different stakeholders can work together to ensure a positive outcome. Looking forward to your discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helga, for that introduction. I believe you've given us the context within which now the reforms and the measures have been proposed and, and the way that they're going to be implemented. And as you said, we look forward to the discussion. But before that, I would like to invite Ms. Peters from the European Commission, who will be delivering a presentation uh, on the European health system's resilience in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, I give you the word, Laura, good morning. Good morning, many thanks Roberta and Helga for the nice introduction and yeah I'd really like to start from a quite broad, um, broad view on the EU level and then come to the Maltese healthcare system and challenges and therefore I'd like to ask my colleague Kalen to, <laughs> to show my slides. So here we are. Yeah, um, I'd like to give you an overview of the so-called state of health in the EU project, but um, which also feeds in the European semester in the field of healthcare. So um, this is really an infrastructure to make health systems information expertise as easily accessible to everyone. So the objective is to strengthen the evidence base on health systems performance for policymakers stakeholders, researchers, and also the general public. The project is run by the European Commission in close partnership with the OECD and the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. And the cycle always kicks off with the so-called Health at a Glance Europe, which is a publication drafted by the OECD and then follows in the next year um, by the country health profiles and the companion report. And the country health profiles are usually drafted by the OECD and the observatory on, based on these country health profiles. The European Commission drafts uh, the so-called companion report, which is really a, a accompanying document um, and has the idea to showcase the selection of cross country issues drawn from the country health profiles. So, yeah. Thank you. Next slide. Um, yeah, the country health profiles um, usually give an overview of the health status in, in one country, but also um, look at the health system's performance. And in the last edition, of course, um, also the performance and resilience in the view of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, the idea is to give policymakers and stakeholders um, an overview or snapshot of the key strengths and challenges in the health system, and also a comparison of with other EU countries. So, um, as I said, the focus in the last edition is really, of course, the impact of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. So, next slide, please. And the companion report, um, based on the country health profile has three main takeaways that I want to highlight today. 
The first one is understanding the far-reaching impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The second one looks at the advantages of digital innovations in healthcare delivery as well as in public health. And the third one is rethinking the health workforce strategies and planning after the COVID-19 pandemic. So the objective of this report is really to act as a bridge between the data and analysis presented in the country health profiles and the various relevant policy initiatives and support instruments by the European Commission. Next slide, please. And to directly kick off with the first topic, the, the health impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, we really tried to better understand the true toll of the pandemic on health. And the first step is to look at life expectancy. And we have seen a steep decline in life expectancy in many EU countries. And uh, this steep decline completely erased in many countries, at least temporarily, almost all gains in life expectancy since 2010. But I'd really like to highlight at this stage already that Malta performed much better in this field than most of the other countries because the, the loss in life expectancy was much smaller than in other countries. Okay, next slide, please. Since the start of the pandemic, one in 10 deaths in the EU was registered as a COVID-19 death. But we also know that this might be an underestimate for several reasons, for example, due to limited testing capacities and also um, issues with the case of death registration. And therefore, we look at the so-called excess mortality, which has the idea to measure the number of deaths reported beyond what we would normally have been expected based on a historical by baseline from several years. And then we see um, that the excess mortality was 12% higher than the reported COVID-19 deaths. And when we have a look at the, um, at the map of Europe, we also see that this excess mortality is quite unevenly distributed across Europe with much higher levels of uh, excess mortality in the Eastern European countries. Next slide, please. But of course, we know the pandemic is still ongoing. We still have uh, very high numbers of COVID-19 in a lot of countries. And um, yeah, of course, um, it's important to also look at, uh, at the other effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we had a lot of foregone care and misdiagnosis in non-COVID care, um, for example, for elective surgery, but also in the field of cancer and postponed um, um, services and treatments and um, no, actually long waiting times for, for certain services as well. And another important point to mention is the huge impact on people's mental health due to social distancing and lockdowns, for example, but also the burden of the post COVID-19 condition will, will keep the health systems busy in the future as well, not, in, not only for the time being. So in summary, we can say here that the number of COVID-19 cases and deaths only provides an incomplete um, picture of the health impact. And the question is really how can health systems adapt not only to address these short-term effects, but also to address long-term effects of the pandemic. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, then let me come to the, to the second takeaway, the locking in the advantages of digital innovation in healthcare delivery and public health. Of course, we have seen in the course of the pandemic a massive acceleration in the take up of digital health tools, especially in the field of telemedicine. And we have also seen a boost in public health. So um, during the pandemic, we used tracing apps or and also big topic was the EU digital COVID certificate um, where you can see the, the vaccination, uh, vaccination stages and, uh, and test and recovery stages um, and also across borders uh, it was usable it is still usable of course <laughs> and um, but the important thing is of course that these innovations will require a thorough and comprehensive evaluation um, to see what is what is relevant and needed for the future needs. Next slide, please. Yes, um, the, all these 
all these ideas and uh, innovations were, were coming from a necessity in the implementation. Um, so looking beyond the pandemic, countries need to reflect on how digital health technologies should be readjusted to serve a broader set of objectives. And therefore, we also need to ask, what, how can we incentivize the use of these technologies in a non-emergency case? And another important point is also to minimize the risk of widening health inequalities through digital exclusion, especially for, uh, special for vulnerable groups, of course. And there is still a need to invest more in the implementation and maintenance of infrastructure and equipment. And um, I'd like to mention the Commission flagship initiative here, the European Health Data Space, what gives access and exchange of health data on the one hand to healthcare providers and patients, but on the other hand, also gives data to research and policy making. Next slide, please. The next point is the rethinking of health workforce strategies and planning after the COVID-19 pandemic. And this slide is really to give you the starting point. So um, we can see that the doctors and nurses are really, we have different ratios and numbers across European countries. Um, and we actually don't know what is the what is the optimal ratio or the optimal number of doctors and nurses. But of course, um, we can say that if both numbers are low, it's difficult for a health system to to adapt and to deal with uh, with crisis. And when we look at the at the map of Europe, um, we can see again that we have a uneven distribution, not only across Europe, across countries, but also within countries and across regions. So, the, um, of course, it is uh, not a new problem that we have health shortages uh, or workforce shortages, but they were brought to the spotlight due to the pandemic. And um, health systems developed certain strategies to, uh, to expand the number of health workers for example, um, by, by bringing in medical students or retired doctors to the systems. But the already existing health workforce in the, uh, in the system were really brought to their limits um, on the one hand to, uh, because they were, had a higher exposure to the, to the virus and had a higher risk of being infected themselves, but also because of the whole stress, it, it, there was a huge impact on the well-being and mental health of uh, health workers. And um, we hear alarming numbers really of um, people leaving the profession. So it's really important to stress again that a well-trained, motivated health workforce of appropriate size and composition is a crucial precondition for building resilient health systems. So the companion report tries to give some, some ideas and solutions on this topic. The one thing is to implement a better workforce planning. Uh, and this also includes the improvement of working conditions, financial and non-financial, to focus the uh, better forecast of future staff needs and also to increase, of course, the investment in training and education. And the third thing is to incentivize the adoption of skill mix innovations. For example, task shifting, but important to stress here that it's not, not for a substitution of workforce, but uh, to gain efficiency for, um, for a better, better uh, allocate the already existing workforce. And um, one example I'd like to mention here is a joint action on workforce planning that the Commission has launched under the EU for Health program. Next slide. And to give a general overview of the recovery and resilience facility, which is, of course, one answer of the Commission to the crisis, um, the aim is really to mitigate the economic and social impact of the pandemic and make European economies and societies more sustainable, resilient and better prepared for future challenges. And um, the recovery and resilience plan invests 
more than 320 billion euros in loans and grants in uh, the European economies. And um, I think Helga already mentioned it, of course, that health resilience is among the six main pillars of the RRF. Um, and to give you maybe in a, in a state of play, um, till now the Commission has adopted um, 24 national recovery and resilience plans, and the Council approved 22 of them already, so two will follow soon. And out of these 22 already approved uh, recovery and resilience plan, 37 billion euros will be spent on health, which is 8% of the total expenditure there. Next slide, please. I'd now like to come to the, to the Maltese country health profile and, uh, and the key challenges um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic in Malta. So um, next slide, please. I'd like to start a bit with an overview of the health status. So this is an overview of the main causes of death in Malta. So um, maybe relevant to mention that um, the COVID-19 value comes from 2020 and the other numbers come from 2018, since we had no more, more current data when the country health profiles were drafted. So it is, um, we can see that Maybe back, please. <laughs> um, yeah, cardiovascular diseases were responsible for 34% of all deaths in 2018, and cancer accounted for another 28%. And in 2020, COVID-19 officially accounted for a bit more than 5% of all deaths. But as I already explained before, this might be an underestimate as well. So next slide then, please. The next slide I'd like to show you is an overview of the of the risk factors that uh, that are showcased in the country health profile. So to maybe a small explanation on the graph itself, it means that the nearer we are with one point in the center of the circle, the better is the performance in this field compared to other health systems in the EU. So. Um, a big challenge uh, in Malta is indeed uh, obesity. So the rates of obesity in Malta are the highest in the EU, with more than one quarter of adults classified as obese. And yeah, of course, poor diets and physical inactivity contribute to high levels of obesity in the country. And um, in general or overall, we can see that, say that over one third of all deaths result from behavioral risk factors. So it is, of course, still important to strengthen public health and prevention. But yeah, of course, it's, it's uh, on, the, on the political agenda, as we know. Next slide, please. This is to showcase the health expenditure and also the share of public funding. And there we can see that um, the, the share of GDP, as well as the total spending on health, is lower in Malta than the EU average. And what is also interesting or important to mention that the share of public funding in Malta is quite, um, quite low compared to the average, but also compared to other uh, tax funded healthcare systems. But also, I'd like to mention that Malta saw a substantial increase in public funding for health during the COVID-19 pandemic with an additional 130 million euros um, committed to the health sector in 2020. The majority of this funding was allocated to procuring PPE, critical care, beds and other medical equipment, as well as to increase the numbers of health workers um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. We also see uh, quite low investments in prevention. And another key objective next to um, strengthening prevention is also to strengthening primary care means on the one hand uh, shifting health service delivery from to primary care for cost effective reasons but also to strengthen the management of um, chronic conditions next slide please 
another topic, um, I think it was also mentioned by Helga in uh, the introduction, that the level of out-pocket spending is quite high in Malta with uh, yeah, the high share is driven on the one hand by direct payments for privately purchased primary care and outpatient specialist care, but also the spending, the out-of-pocket spending on pharmaceuticals and long-term care is, um, is also high. But interesting to mention here that the levels of unmet needs in Malta are really low compared to other EU countries. Next slide, please. This is the um, graph you've already seen, but um, just to show you where, where Malta is compared to the EU average there. So we see that Malta has a slightly higher density of physicians in the EU compared uh, to the EU average, and the density of nurses is slightly below the EU average. But um, yeah, what we see that the shortage that there are shortages in certain specialties and. Uh, Hospitals are really re reliant on foreign trained nurses, the same for long-term care. And another challenging point is really the recruitment and retention of GPs since this number is declining since 2009. Okay, next slide please. And when we come to the resilience of the pandemic, um, there were of course structural weaknesses in the health sector prompting rapid responses but of course this is the case for all uh, for all um, health systems in the in the eu so it's not uh, only malta of course but um to mention specifically for malta maybe um workforce mobilization on the one hand um there were several strategies to to uh, increase the capacities in the during the pandemic where professionals were redeployed to other settings or um, early graduation of final year medical students and nurses to assist healthcare professionals and another point volunteers who were recruited to assist um, professionals or to answer the COVID-19 help lines. There was also a rapid rise in the use of digital health tools to promote access. Uh, for example, the use of remote consultations and primary care really increased um, and helped to ensure the continuity of care. There is a special telemedicine hub for primary care that was established during the pandemic. And of course, um, e-prescriptions and electronic submissions of sickness certificates were, were used much more than before. But on the other hand, Malta entered the COVID-19 pandemic with limited hospital capacity. And major restructuring in recent years has seen the number of acute and long term care beds in Malta fluctuate. And the occupancy rates of acute care beds before the crisis were frequently ran at over 18%, which is among the highest rates, uh, one of the highest rates in the EU. But rapid action was taken during the pandemic to expand hospital capacity, especially intensive care beds. Next slide, please. So to improve for the future, um, their investments, especially aimed at certain areas, as mentioned in prevention activities in strengthening primary care, but also in health facilities in infrastructure, like, um, like the so-called pandemic reserve and also the development of an outpatient building at the Matadei hospital and the modernization of health centers and community clinics all across the country. And another big point, of course, digitalization in health. So um, it is planned to establish an integrated electronic patient record across primary care. Um, and all these topics are, are funded on the one hand by the national budget, but also by, by EU funds, for example, by cohesion funding. And then the another point, which is also the, the big topic today um, by the recovery and resilience facility. So next slide, please. So to, I'd just like to give you a short overview then um, about the Maltese recovery and resilience plan. It has a total budget of 300 16 million euros and around seven, 70 million are re health related. But um, 
we can subtract 20, 20 million since they will be used for the for the roof topping and uh, and renovation of a hospital to make it more climate efficient. So the big health topic is component four, strengthening the resilience of the health system with around 15, 50 million euros. Next slide, please. And this component consists of uh, several measures. The one is uh, the development of a of a workforce planning tool to prepare better for the future regarding workforce. Another big point is to improve the well-being and integration of foreign health workers. Um, there will be a, or there is a survey, and afterwards, it will be seen with how the how the survey will feed. Uh, the strategy to improve the well-being and integration. There are several measures to enhance the disease prevention to children's health, for example, also in the field of obesity. And um, the biggest investment is for the establishment of a blood tissue and cell center in Malta, um, also linked to the review of the legis legislative framework. And another big point is the digitalization and new technologies, um, such as a new magnetic resonance linear accelerator, which is the biggest investment in this field. Next slide. So that's already it from, from my side. Um, I just um, highlighted here, or want to give you the, the web pages that will be accessible afterwards. Um, the one state of health in the EU, there you can find the companion report as well as all country health profiles. And under the recovery and resilience webpage, you can find the general explanation on the on the RF, but also the links to the national recovery and resilience plan. So many thanks for your interest. Thank you so much, Laura, for that very comprehensive snapshot of what's happening across the EU the challenges that we are facing as a country as well, and also as a continent, and then also zooming in on the actual uh, reforms and investments that are being proposed and are underway, I understand as well, uh, in order to meet these challenges. So thank you very much for that. Um, I would like to see, before we kick off the panel discussion, I would like to ask if there are any re anybody who would, would like to react to anything that was said in the in the presentation. No. Yes, I have Dr. Gad. Yes, uh, good morning to you all. Good morning. Uh, thank you for, for this opportunity and thank you, uh, Laura, for, for the, the detailed um, presentation. Um, it is, I noticed that uh, during the pandemic, the uh, Maltese mortality um, was not as high as, as the other countries. Um, I don't know if there are any studies that might indicate what is the reason for this. Um, we are happy, of course, that of the, um, for this, but um, it would be perhaps that we took more stricter controls, and especially in the first year of the pandemic, um maybe um, our lockdown was more um intense i don't know um but i'm happy that that this this is the result of of our actions um the uh, the pandemic has has resulted uh, in in uh, uh, a remarkable transformation of of our services from from being basically paper based um, or a simple Excel sheet, so to speak, um, to, to um, uh, increasing digitalization um, of our uh, COVID-19 response. And uh, um, recently, in December, um, a new um, IT system was launched. It, 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 it was built up over uh, several months. Uh, and this IT system is now covering basically all um, the different um, fields of, of the COVID-19 response from case management to contact tracing and, and discharge, as well as data management. And, and uh, it has proved um, of immense um, help 
in the sense that uh, this system uh, is facilitating uh, many much of our work. Uh, it has enabled most or many of the public health uh, consultants and 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 uh, and resident specialists, etc., to return to their pre-COVID work, which obviously um, uh, was delayed. Or as, 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 as you can understand. And, and we hope that um, uh, in the next few weeks and months, um, the rest of the public health team um, will return to pre-COVID um, work. Um, we should put this into perspective in the sense that um, uh, the uh, national public health response um, was managed solely by the public health officers within the government service. Um, and uh, I'm saying this because we realize when we compare uh, with our colleagues in other EU countries, especially the larger countries, um, where um, the, the response was managed more locally in each different um, region, towns or whatever. Um, whereas we had to, the burden of, um, uh, reacting to uh, this unexpected um, pressure of work and and uh, control and prevention of COVID-19. I think uh, for me, for now, uh, it's enough. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gatt, for your observations. Um, Ms. Peters, I don't know if you, you would like in, in turn to, to comment on these observations. Yeah, thank you already. Um, yeah. It's always, of course, interesting to hear how people from the national health authorities um, see this on the ground. But um, yeah, actually, you're absolutely, or I totally agree that there was a was a um, huge development in the health systems on in the field of digitalization and healthcare delivery. So I think Malta is really one of the of the better performers uh, in the in, in the course of the pandemic. But um, I mean, what what the reason is that really the numbers of deaths uh, were were so much lower than in other countries. Of course, this is an in interesting question, but uh, it's always difficult to to answer it because, um, of course, it's always difficult to to also compare the the countries with another. But um, yeah, there, of course, there were several measures in in place, and also people reacted differently to these measures that were that were in place by the government. So I don't know if the Maltese people stick more to the to the measures that were imposed on them, but <laughs> this is just um, yeah. So we really can't answer this question. For example, we had Norway. This was the only country in the whole Europe which had uh, less, less excess mortality in the course of the pandemic. Uh, so they had lower numbers of deaths than in the years before, what is really a par paradoxon, of course, and no one can explain it. I think we were all very well behaved, Dr. Gatt, don't you think, especially in the beginning? Yeah, yes, I think so, I think. Um, especially in the first year, I think um, um, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the camaraderie between, between uh, uh, the different components of the population and um, uh, especially the, the elderly and people wanted to protect the elderly. So um, I think the measures worked, worked well. Um, it is interesting to note, I think I believe that Sweden um, was the only country that did not have a lockdown. Um, I'm not sure whether their mortality rate was high or, or average or low, I don't know. It was actually indeed also lower, the excess mortality, but is also paradoxon, of course, but um, for especially for the Scandinavian countries, um, yeah, a lot of people think that this is because the country is so big and not so densely populated, of course. So this is also an explanation that they usually don't accept the main cities, of course, but uh, there are a lot of regions where you have a low density of people living there. So they don't have so many contacts than people living in cities. But um, yeah, <laughs> but of course, it's only a part of the explanation. I think that requires a whole study and perhaps another webinar. <laughs> Look into that in detail. <laughs> no, but I think with our highly density in the country, people ex uh, accepted it. I think there was not uh, a lot from the public where they went against all the measures. 
I think there was a high acceptance which actually helped. No. Thank you for that. I don't know if there are any other panelists who would like to react uh, to Ms. Peter's presentation before we actually kick off um, our panel discussion where we're going to really focus on, on the national situation. No more raised hands, so I believe we can kick off. Thank you, Ms. Peters. Oh, here, Mr. Rizzo, yes. Unmute myself. Yes, please. <clears throat> okay. And first of all, thank you very much for the information. Um, I cannot put my camera on, but if you're hearing me, I can continue. We can. You, I think you should accept your um, invitation <clears throat> to rejoin as panelists, because otherwise we cannot see you. There. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Oh, here I am. Let's see. Okay. So there you are. We can see you. <laughs> I'm a little, a little bit in the dark, but <laughs> the situation is this. Yes, uh, interesting to hear um, Miss Laura and uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Elul, and also Mr. Gatt. From my side, I come, apart from being a representative of the Economic and Social Forum, representing NGOs, really my, my expertise as an accountant is in obviously taxation and education. So, but anyway, I, I do follow. What I can say is from perhaps my experience as now president of the Federation of Professional Associations is that most professionals have been under pressure for quite some time, especially the frontliners, um, doctors, nurses, um, pharmacists and, uh, you know, healthcare, healthcare people who are in, involved in healthcare, physiotherapists, etc., etc. So I think the effect on, on, on the professionals will hit Malta at a later stage. I think at the moment, everybody is going on and trying to do its utmost to, to solve the issues. But when I think the pandemic will really go, the pandemic numbers will really go down, then we can, we can start um, seeing the effects on, on professionals. One, one, one interesting point is that what I got from my colleagues is that when it comes to um, <clears throat> psychologists, they, they saw an increase in in the number of interventions that they had to do um, because people were closed in for, for instance, my mother who is in a home has been closed in for 15 months. And if it, if it wasn't for, for instance, giving her a phone where she could see us, then, you know, I don't know if she would have survived um, that long closure in a home. But now she's well, you know, a lot of people are recovering, but I think we have to see exactly what happens uh, to the professionals who are frontliners. I think the, the effect will come at a later stage. Um, obviously, um, the, the precautions taken by government and by the health sector were good. Uh, I, I agree to practically all of them. Perhaps uh, there could have been better understanding of accepting people coming coming to Malta uh, who were not fully vaccinated. I think that that might have added a little bit the numbers in Malta. But all in all, I agree that the situation was very well uh, taken care of, and that as uh, Mrs. Elul said, the population took care of themselves, took care, took care of their health situation and helped by taking all the precautions necessary. Regarding <clears throat> professional, I think in Malta, what we need is perhaps better specialized units, apart from the main hospital, to take care of special areas where 
there would be then a relief on the main hospital, which I think at the moment is overworked. Thank you very much. Yes, I believe. I believe that was also reflected in the country specific recommendations. Um, if I may, um, I would really like to start um, zooming in on the actual reforms and investments within component number four of our uh, recovery and resilience plan. And uh, in relation to this, perhaps I can come back to you, Dr. Gatt. Can you, and, and Ms. Peters already touched upon them, but maybe you can uh, give us some further details about the actual me measures that are envisaged under this component and what stage they're at if they have already started being implemented. Okay, by all means, by all means. Um, in in a short reply to Mr. Rizzo, um, it is uh, and he and, the, and he highlighted this point. Um, the the uh, many people suffer from mental health difficulties and problems during the pandemic, um, and and we saw this um, during uh, or rather when people were being. Uh, quarantined for, for two weeks and initially even for more than two weeks um, because the initial quarantine period was 28 days for the first uh, few weeks and uh, we offered um, psychological psychological support and social worker support um, and even um, mental professional support through um, our mental health services and also the Richmond Foundation. So I must thank these services. Um, yes, uh, you asked uh, at what stage are these services um, being? So I think um, there are six or seven questions that you had put on the list. Um, shall we just work the through them one by one or? Okay. No, no, just the first question at this point. So within the health policy framework okay. and then the actual measures within the recovery and resilience plan. All What's right, so yeah, I can understand. That. I can answer that, yes. Um, um, it will regards to the health policy framework. We have a, a policy, uh, I've been going through it uh, in the past two days, um, which is prepared. Uh, it is at the stage where it needs uh, to be reviewed by the, uh, the Minister for Health after that it will move on to a wider consultation phase um, and, and then the final uh, policy will be uh, finalized uh, and, and published. Um, I, what, how, rather how we do these uh, sort of policy um, um, uh, documents or um, frameworks um, we, we consult um, the relevant uh, entities uh, when um, at, the, at the initial phase of, of the uh, uh, process and then uh, the, uh, the policy is written uh, and once that is written, it is uh, then it goes out to the wider consultation phase and even to the public. So that's, that's the phase it is in. Okay, so there has already been a, an initial level of consultation, I understand. Yes, yes, you can say that, yes. Okay, okay, thank you, Dr. De Guara. Maybe I can come to you, um, hear your reactions to what has been said so far, um, and also to Dr. Gatt's comments. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for inviting me over and thank you for the farewell presented presentation. Uh, from my point, obviously, I come from a background of a family practice, mostly in the private sector. I've worked both in public and even in private, but obviously I am fully fledged as a, as a private. Um, it was interesting to note also that there is a decrease in the amount of general practitioners, uh, even as said in the, in the presentation. And I think uh, nowadays that is also a very big problem we are facing. I am also on the assessment uh, as a medical doctor to assess new inputs of uh, general practitioners onto the, the market. However, I must admit that we are finding it very difficult for certain individuals to pursue a future and a career in the private market. Uh, I think uh, two main factors. Uh, one is the factor when 
government uh, issued a contract A and a contract B service system. So the newly graduated would be more inclined into going with government for better job security, better stability, uh, better backup, rather than going into a fully fledged uh, private, private market sector. Uh, it is also interesting to note that um, when I had even done a thesis on, on family practice uh, in the private sector, although Malta has both a private and a public sector, uh, still the highest amount of individuals seek uh, private, uh, the private market sector. So be it for a normal GP consult, be it for a specialist treatment, they prefer to go privately rather than outsourcing into uh, the government um, sector. I must say that, yes, we have seen major improvements from uh, government and even digitalized health. Um, I think it, we were always saying this in uh, the health sector has to have an input of digitalization. But uh, uh, paradoxically, I think it was the pandemic which got them uh, kickstarted to really invest into into this sector, which uh, I have to say that our colleagues in public health have done a sterling job. One, one point I would like to, to also point out is that even though uh, public sectors like the, the primary healthcare in government have offered telemedicine and have also offered a free service, uh, I believe coming also from the private sector that this was not highly um, inform informative towards the general public. So uh, we are still seeing, we still have an aging population and we have to uh, not forget those aging population who are not too digitalized uh, oriented. So it's one thing saying this and we have gone digitalized on certain issues, uh, but we really have to bring, uh, bring that home to, to the major uh, of the population. We are also having uh, another input into our system from a lot of foreigners. So most of our health sector workers are foreign, foreigners, basically. Uh, coming in from other countries and we have to see uh, to their needs also because that is something I think uh, it, it's going to be challenging uh, for our health uh, sector system. Uh, it was also interesting to note that listen the um, policies are being encouraged and are being uh, taken into consideration which I am very uh, happy to, to see that. Uh, what I think we should really do is that we have to try and find uh, lies in between the private sector and the public sector. Uh, I think in today's world, putting everything or dishing everything onto the public sector uh, is even more costly sometimes than dishing it out onto the private sector. Uh, so I think we have to change the um, idea of government, listen, let's go and invest more in the public funding sector, opening up more clinics and whatnot. I mean, I think the easiest in the health sector is to open up new hospitals, new clinics, new services. Uh, the biggest challenge is uh, finding people to work into uh, those sectors. And um, I think Malta, the advantage that we're basically um, an island, uh, well, we're even, I think, as small as some cities, <laughs> um, that we can ha we have such a good private sector market uh, that I think if uh, government really sits down, obviously, um, from the Chamber of Commerce section now, that if government really sits down um, and we really try and find a unity between both sectors, I think that the end product towards the client, they will have a better product and even sometimes it can even be cheaper uh, if government really takes on board the private sector. So I think this is something that we should really uh, look into. In fact, yes, Dr. Deguer, I think you preempted my next question um, because um, a lot was mentioned also in the in the initial presentation on prevention. So my question to you and also to the other panelists uh, was how do you see that the private sector can contribute to this tangibly in terms of increasing our efforts in prevention? Well, I think prevention, uh, the most important thing that one can actually do is that we have to get an awareness uh, into our community and even our population. Mm -hmm. So let's say we have seen that obesity is the number one uh, cardiovascular disease and all these are, are sectors which uh, Malta uh, fares very high on, on problems uh, to them. So I think prevention is the key. 
Um, it will take time because obviously it's very difficult to change attitudes uh, of, um, of a nation, let's put it this way. And let's say if we're taking obesity, it's one thing telling people, listen, uh, go healthy, eat healthy. Uh, but then when you look actually on the, on the ground where, where we actually work, uh, eating healthy is more costly than eating, uh, let's say, fast food sometimes. So that is an issue where uh, I think we, we really have to have to target. So it's easy to tell everyone, listen, go healthy, eat your veggies, eat your, you know, uh, stuff when we know that the major uh, community uh, finds it challenging in order to, to try and go on to this type of, uh, of prevention. Now, um, I think if we invest heavily in, uh, in marketing in the sense that we, we inform clients, we try and even see how we can um, get a healthy lifestyle, uh, which is affordable, for most, uh, in the future, it will it will be even more economic towards uh, the nation. Uh, because if we manage to prevent most diseases, then we will be uh, reducing the load on both the public and the the private market, uh, as well as obviously bringing the life being of the individuals uh, to a higher level. So I think that is my my honest opinion about this. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see that Dr. Gatt would like to react. I think you are muted, Dr. Gatt. Dr. Deguara, sorry. Sorry. Um, um, apologies. <clears throat> um, yes, uh, I, I concur to what uh, Dr. Deguara has said. And uh, uh, we, we, uh, we know that uh, we have this particular divide, social and uh, economic divide in, in, in the country, um, where the, there are two main socioeconomic groups, the well-educated and high socioeconomic group with less mortality, less smoking habits, less um, alcoholism, um, and they usually fare much better um, in terms of lifestyle and chronic diseases, whereas we have the lower socioeconomic group, which is less educated. And it is this social, lower socioeconomic group that is carrying the, the burden of, of obesity mostly, um, overweight, uh, smoking, alcohol, and, and other, um, and even um, uh, uh, sexual behavior, which is, which is uh, um, not really acceptable. Um, it is not saying that the higher socioeconomic group does not um, have these habits. What we are seeing is that there is a divide of about 30% between the two um, uh, socioeconomic groups in terms of survival, in terms of um, uh, uh, prevalence of, of chronic diseases, etc. And uh, the, the greatest challenge is to reach the so lower socioeconomic groups. If you are educated and you know how to use a digitalized system and you know how to access the internet and, and to um, positively contribute to your chronic illness in terms of um, knowing about it and in terms of um, learning to deal with it is different from the lower socioeconomic group, which um, many of them cannot reach or can, do not have the capacity of uh, uh, digitalization access. So, um, so far, so far, um, we have over the years seen the success of what we call the discharge liaison um, nurses and midwifery schemes. And, and uh, in terms of um, trying to reach this section of the population, we plan to uh, address obesity and uh, dietary problems, et cetera, in terms of more direct reach outreaches to this group of, um, uh, uh, of the population, the subgroup of the population. Um, we need to, um, there are plans rather, to uh, study ways of um, working with kindergarten levels, with primary schools, et cetera. We need to reach these people very early on in life. Once a, a child is already obese by seven years of age, it becomes very difficult 
for that individual as the individual grows uh, over the years um, to, to lose or to change the habits. So we need to teach um, these habits very early on in life and we need to find ways to do this. Um, the private sector might, in my opinion, might try to find ways of um, assisting uh, in, in this direction, in the sense um, uh, that collaboration or collaborative ways can be found between the government and uh, the private sector in, in working on, on, for example, um, good nutrition, exercise, uh, good habits in life, etc. So um, we will, uh, we will, uh, and we are trying to plan for these. Uh, it is good to say that yes, what Dr. Teguara said is that um, we are losing over the years the older GPs in the community, and uh, this is uh, a, a default, perhaps, of the system as it is, as he said. Um, uh, now, the way things have developed, um, but we need more GPs in the community. People, um, well, not necessarily prefer, but uh, very often when they go to a private GP, it is because they do not want to go uh, to a health center uh, and wait in the queue or because the general practitioner is, is only a short distance away from, from their house, or because the general practitioner is a family practitioner and has known the family for many, many, many years. So, that, so these are the positive aspects of being a GP. Um, perhaps also um, uh, the general practice is not offering that much of uh, good remuneration in terms of private practice. I'm not sure about that, um, uh, but we can improve on that, certainly. Um, and we also might um, propose ways of um, the government assisting private individuals or in their private consultations. Uh, for example, in, uh, instead of the government taking all the load of, of uh, general practice, which is not certainly um, much something that we desire, um, but we can, uh, the government can sort of um, give a go payment to, to, to uh, a, port or a, a portion of the payment of, of a consultation. That is something which needs to be studied and, and uh, in the future and, and we'll have to see. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gatt. Um, just to remain on the topic of the workforce now within the health sector, I believe that Ms. Peters touched upon this topic as well in her presentation. So in terms of creating a stronger workforce, what needs to be done and how can employers, both public, public sector employers and also private sector employers, um, turn this goal into a reality at the end of the day? Maybe, Mr. Rizzo, maybe I can direct this question to you. Thank you. Yes, I was going. I raised my hand. <laughs> well, as we are seeing it from studies that we have done um, at university with university students and um, sixth formers and, and also um, when we asked uh, certain uh, um, people, excuse me, this phone is ringing. I just, just killed it off. <laughs> Usually it happens when, we, when you start talking. Well, we are seeing that um, given the size of the population and knowing that we have practically um, all, all the people who want to work are working, it seems that people are choosing in which uh, um, profession they would like to, to, to be involved in. And we are seeing that, yes, the number of, for instance, of doctors, engineers is dwindling. The number of people starting courses at university is dwindling in these, in these areas because they are 
preferring to go in other areas. Not so much in other health areas as well, not so much in, in the areas where, where there are the doctors, for instance, and the, and the pharmacists, mostly, because I think numbers are dwindling there. It's, it's difficult. It's difficult. So we have to rely on offering packages from perhaps um, uh, profession, professionals outside, outside Malta to come, to come and practice in Malta for perhaps a number of years, five year, 10 year, 10 year term. But uh, this is what we're seeing that the number of, that the number of profession, the number of people trying to go in university to study for much needed professionals, I think is dwindling. And we have to look, we have to look and see why this is happening. Because in, in the past, I think people wanted the first choice for people with high marks at, you know, at high marks entering university were for doctors and lawyers. This has changed a little bit. I'm an accountant by profession, you know, accountancy profession has increased enormously, but I can see that the engineering uh, profession can increase, but we are seeing that the number of people going in engineering is dwindling. So, you know, that, that something, things are happening and perhaps we, we need to uh, perhaps spend on more time on education, educating people and how to choose careers. Because I think in the long run, we need the doctors, we need the, the, the dentists, we need the pharmacists, perhaps more than the lawyers, I don't know, because lawyers now are even specializing. You know, you know, you know about that. My daughter is a, is a lawyer, but she's specializing in intellectual property. So not so much going to the courts, but you know, this is what is happening. People are finding their niche where they can work and they can contribute to what, what they would like to do with their lives. And I think we have to study at that level. So we have to rethink education. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. De Buara. May I come to you for your take on this? Uh, yes, I think uh, I tend to agree. <laughs> Uh, that uh, our profession and other professions are dwindling. Uh, but uh, from, from my aspect or, or the way I see it is that one has to also look into job security and job satisfaction. Uh, when it comes to the health sector, unfortunately, um, whereas before it was a prized um, work saying, listen, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer. I'm, uh, nowadays, unfortunately, you find um, job security and even job opportunities in other fields which gives you a better stability i i would tend to say and even satisfaction so uh, we have let's say uh, pharmacists were mentioned whereas before the pharmacist uh, it it was let's say a profession uh, nowadays a pharmacist has become a, like a, another vending uh, person in the pharmacy number one before pharmacists used to be involved in actually uh, mixing uh, components, whereas today it's just this selling off the counter, uh, even though, I mean, so many pharmacists today go into Q and days uh, with private companies, because obviously they have much more job security and even uh, job opportunities in, in that sector. So we are losing a lot of the community uh, pharmacists. And even if you actually speak to, uh, to people who own or actually run pharmacies, uh, their number one headache is listen, how can I actually find a pharmacist to do a locum? Whereas before they were easy, nowadays it's become difficult. When it comes even to the health sector, uh, I tend to um, yes, see, see that uh, job satisfaction has dwindled. And now it has dwindled because the workload has increased uh, both gov with government sector. I think even uh, the job, there is job stability for sure. There is job security, no doubt. However, when it comes to satisfaction, then it's a it's a bit of a different uh, different area. I remember the days when I used to work in the in the public sector uh, as a GP. Uh, job satisfaction was close to zero, for the simple reason that number one, uh, people just come to you just to get you know a quick fix, and they are not really interested in follow ups. And I think even. Um, the my other colleague has just mentioned uh, in the private sector people 
keep choosing the private over the public. I think for the simple reason that they are actually coming to an individual who knows their history. And they know that the next time round they are going to find the same person. Whereas we find it uh, very different in the public sector where today you're seeing Dr. X, tomorrow you're seeing Dr. Y, and the day after you're seeing another, another colleague. Uh, so I think for, for a long-term effect, that is something uh, that one has to, has to look into. Um, regarding how to entail more people into fields uh, which are dwindling, I think one has to actually see uh, how we can actually help them out in the sense, is it just by increasing a pay? Is it just by increasing stability or security? I think it's more about job satisfaction, which we have to work upon um, rather than uh, other areas for the simple reason that uh, many individuals are not choosing uh, our uh, profession for the simple reason that you can find other professions which you can go into, which probably give you a better pay uh, for less work in the sense that listen it's uh, eight to one job and then after that job you're you're free to do anything you want whereas in the medical field it's a bit of a different issue there uh, also i think the fact that we see uh, doctors who work both in the private as well as in the public uh, i think we also have to look into that and why that is happening because i think uh, when you look at uh, the foreigners basically doctors working in UK and in other countries, uh, they usually just stick to one job with government and they do not even uh, look into the system of, listen, I'll work privately. Uh, also, I think something we have to look into that over here, the private sector is a no man's land. So you, you're a sole person alone, whereas other countries like other EU countries, uh, there are trusts and the government which actually offers uh, a good financial package towards these systems. Uh, which even helps them uh, invest and also uh, expand their services more uh, towards the client. So I think there are multiple factors uh, we can look into uh, to see uh, how we can actually improve. I don't think it's just by guiding individuals because, uh, you know, you can sugarcoat it any way you want, any profession, but at the end of the day, uh, the individual will see what he wants out of the profession and you know i don't think that sugarcoating any profession will get them get them going uh, let's say many many even um, lawyers so they have gone into eu uh, fraud and and whatnot because that is where the the sectors want to go and uh, you know maybe court whereas before court used to give a kick to most lawyers nowadays uh, it doesn't seem to be the preferred uh, choice <laughs> so Yes, I, I think that resonates with, with, with many different professions. Thank you for that. Um, I'm very conscious of the time. So if you allow me, I'm going to move on to the next question because I really want to uh, be able to cover all the different aspects of, of the recovery and resilience plan. And there was mention even in Laura's presentation towards the beginning of a blood tissue and cell center. Uh, Dr. De Dr. Gath, I think perhaps you can answer this one. What is it uh, for the ones who are not medical? So we don't really understand what this is and why is it needed? Thank you for giving me the floor. Yes, um, uh, we have, Currently, a new center being built for blood tissue and cell, as blood and tissue and cell center. Um, it is um, important at this stage of development of the, our health system to have this center. Um, we need this center in order to be able to store and, and, and use it to store body tissues, blood tissue cell centers, um, and also in order to use it as a banking system or um, tissues um, coming from, from the human body. Um, for example, um, uh, we, we can become almost self-sufficient when with regards to plasma derived products, when we have this center. Um, we need um, the center also to store stem cells uh, for stem cell transplantations, HLA typing and tissue um, banking, cornea, bone, um, skin and tendons, um, this is necessary. Um, for example, uh, if we need to do HLA typing, which is necessary 
um, before uh, uh, an organ is transplanted uh, in Malta, okay, we have currently difficulties in doing so. Uh, and so we need to rely uh, where necessary on foreign laboratories. And so we need to move, um, if we need to um, develop further uh, organ transplantation um, uh, properties, um, we need to uh, this center. Uh, it is important to say that um, along with the center, we already have the necessary legislation in place. Um, and most of this is EU legislation, which has been transposed over the years. Um, for example, we have uh, the Blood and Transplant Act of uh, 2007, the tissue cells, um, tissues and cells of 2014, human tissues and cells uh, of 2007, etc. So there is a host of legislation which is already in place. Um, some of the legislation has been created by um, uh, by Malta, but most of the legislation is uh, transposed directly from EU legislation. Um, uh, um, so the so to speak, the the framework, the legal framework for this center is now already in place. Okay, and the actual setting up of the center is that underway already? Because I, I understand this is a substantial investment within the plan, right? Yes, it is already in place. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Dr. De Guerra, once again, and also Mr. Itzo, um, there was a lot of uh, focus on digitization within the health system. Uh, both in Ms. Peter's presentation, but also during our discussion so far. How is this going to make our health system more resilient? Because the topic after all is that, it's resilience. Who goes first, uh, Dr. De Guerra? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, Digitalization has become very important, especially COVID has opened up uh, this area to most professionals. And many professionals like myself, for instance, where I want to talk with my colleagues, usually we do it virtual because it's easier, more convenient for us. Uh, we do what we have to do. We pick up the right time. We spend an hour. We discuss everything in one hour. So even in our thoughts and, and the way we act between ourselves, we try to be as, you know, as synthetic as possible, um, not to go over the time limits that we would have established ourselves. So setting a meeting for my maximum meeting is 100 minutes, you know, usually I go for an hour, but my, when, when there is other things to discuss, I say after 100 minutes, everybody is tired and no new ideas uh, come along. So. Yes, digitalization has helped, as I said before, certain, for instance, um, <clears throat> psychologists turned to, to, to digitalization and doing work via a computer more than perhaps other, other because they, they could do it. For instance, uh, you know, a physiotherapist cannot, <laughs> cannot do the work <laughs> virtually. It has, it has to be, it has to be there and speech language pathologists, whatever, they have to be there, although certain work can be done. I would just want to add one point, what uh, Dr. Daguara said about pharmacists. 12 years ago, 14 years ago, I also thought that pharmacists were there to sell you a product which they have in the, which they have in the, in the pharmacy. The, the chamber of pharmacists have done a lot of work in this direction, and now, when you go and buy, or the doctor orders you some type of medicine, when you go to, a, to the local pharmacist, they will ask you why you're going to take it and if it's the best, or else phone your doctor again in front of us so that we can help him, so we can help you to, so that you choose the, the, right, uh, the right medicine. So I think the, the stigma that was stuck with certain pharmacists is going down. Also, I happen to know pharmacists who are now 
working in laboratories, okay, medical laboratories, and also food laboratories. So you know, the the, the pharmacists have have tried also to find a way outside pharmacies because, as you know, there is this rule that you cannot have so many pharmacies in in a, in any town depending on the population. So so the whole situation changed even that profession of how uh, how they work. So I think yes. Um, digitalization will definitely work better. In fact, I am being asked to to give um, my opinion via <laughs> virtually to um, my foreign com, uh, co uh, companions, and because I tell them, no, it's no use traveling, spending what seven eight hours going going to a place and coming back. Well, while you are all all, all only have to speak for for or have a panel for one hour. So, you know, that has changed even our mind of for traveling and delivering. So I think, yes, everybody is, is being aware of the consequences, especially of COVID. But now, no, with, with the increase in fuel and with the increase in spending uh, time in a hotel, etc., etc., people are rethinking of how to utilize their time. I think this is, a, this is important. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. So, Dr. De Guara, back to you. The, the, the idea of digitalization in terms of developing our resilience. I'm all out for digitalization. So that's uh, no doubt. And as I said, I think COVID kickstarted it. Uh, but I think we really need to understand what we want uh, by digitalization in the sense that uh, we do have already a setup, digitalized setup uh, in the government hospital, uh, which is uh, very helpful. Um, let's say someone who's coming into ER, we will take all tests and it can be seen by an orthopedic who's on call from his own home, let's say. Uh, so in that process, that has really facilitated uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, even if we're going to send a client abroad who requires treatment, then as medical professionals, we exchange uh, all the stuff and all the files beforehand uh, before actually seeing the patient. Uh, we can also now access by listening, uh, listening to the patient, doing a consultation prior to him or her going abroad for treatment. So that is where digitalization has really improved. However, I have to be very blunt in this, where I think that we are still far ahead from bringing the public and the private sector together on this aspect. Let's say uh, someone who is sent by a private clinic or a private GP towards hospital uh, to do an X-ray can request an X-ray digitalized, digitalized by by ordering it online from his own uh, mobile. So that is not a, not an issue, and that has improved drastically. We have cut down a lot of paperwork, but when it comes to actually taking the image the image is not sent directly to the doctor who has requested it. So the only uh, doctor or colleague who can actually have access to it is someone who's working in the public health sector. So the private sector, they have facilitated the effect of uh, removing most of the paperwork to order uh, the investigations, yes. But then if it comes to imaging, we have to wait for seven to 10 days to actually get the result, not even the image. So I think if we really want uh, that digitalization works, I think that uh, it has to be accessible to each uh, sector individually. Uh, I believe that many colleagues uh, nowadays are capable because training has taken them uh, quite well uh, into training. They even have uh, training in radiography and whatnot. So I think uh, that being able to send an individual to the public sector to get an X-ray, which can be viewed instantly on the practitioner's uh, mobile or PC, uh, rather than wait for 10 days to get the result. I think that is where uh, true digitalization would have taken effect. As it is right now, I think we're just touching on base that, listen, uh, we have put into a digitalized system because we have cut down on paperwork. Fine, good, uh, let's get going. But I think there, there is a lot yet to be done if we really want to get the full potential of digitalization. Also, uh, both uh, from uh, people who work in the private sector and the public sector also, there should be a direct link. So rather than doing, listen, uh, you can call your colleague who's on call. I think there should be a system digitalized, obviously, 
which can access and people can see the image instantly and there would be a 24-7 call between, between uh, professionals. I think there is where then uh, I would tend to agree that, listen, uh, digitalization has taken effect and has also cut down a lot uh, on the health sectors for the benefit of the, of the patient. So I think that is uh, um, where I see we have to get going. And I think now it's useless saying this in we're working, we're working. I think digitalization is exploding uh, in the system. And I think we have to keep going on to the speed that uh, we have actually taken care of. Uh, let's say public health have issued, and as my colleague well said, a very good system, which is now fully digitalized for COVID patients. So if it's some, as soon as one is uh, positive, he receives an SMS, he receives a letter to tell him how long he has to stay there and, and whatnot. Uh, so I think that is where we really have to go. We have to really get a whole package uh, of digitalized package uh, to the end client uh, so that we would say we have achieved uh, onto it rather than getting bits and pieces and trying to listen. We've cut down on paperwork here, cut down on paperwork there, um, you know. That is where we have to really go. And also educating our nation on getting digitalized, because I think as yet we are still far off. Let's say many, many government sectors, people can pay their bills online. But when it comes to the older population, I tend to still see people actually uh, not using this service and going physically there. Uh, so, you know, to pay their bills. So even though they have digitalized a lot there, um, we are still far from, uh, from I think the achievement we wanted to achieve. Let's put it this way. Dr. Gatt, um, there are specific um, technological investments which are envisaged under the plan, correct? Yeah. Maybe you can just give us very quickly uh, an overview of what these are. Yes, uh, you are correct. Uh, uh, yes, in, in practice, um, we have we, all, we are working and we are planning also um, um, digital applications um, and I will mention a few examples. Uh, the, uh, the primary healthcare has uh, now launched the electronic patient record system uh, within the department. Um, this is already being uh, show, showing that uh, it is effective. It is also carrying the patient record so that eventually paper-based records will be eliminated. And so there is more continuity between one doctor and the other, or one clinic within the primary health centers or uh, and the other. Uh, it will also eventually be integrated with the rest of the IT systems in modern day hospitals. Let's say the laboratory um, uh, information system, the medical imaging system, appointment system, et cetera as well as the other e-health services, such as immunizations, medications, and e-prescriptions. Um, so the EPR is a, is a very good step forward. Um, of course, um, uh, as Dr. Daguara said, the digital literacy uh, of uh, certain part of the population uh, or certain groups of the population is important, and we need, we need to reach out to these people. There is also, as he mentioned, but not necessarily by name. There is the uh, system, what we call my, the My Health system, which enables GPs, for example, to order uh, geography investigations, blood investigations, and uh, which also transmits the results of patients, etc. We need to enhance this system further. Um, so here I am following what Dr. Deguara has already um, said. Last year, I think it was in uh, February or March last year, the government uh, launched the remote patient monitoring program for primary um, for type 1 diabetics. Um, this was launched for uh, children uh, till I think 16 years of age, if I'm not mistaken. And um, um, this has proved to be a very good system in, in, uh, in uh, controlling the blood sugar levels of insulin dependent the, uh, diabetes in young people uh, with direct uh, reference of the uh, 
glucose levels to uh, the uh, hospital uh, base system in Mother Day Hospital. And uh, so the private sector here provided the, uh, the necessary uh, setup for this system to work in conjunction with the government system. So I think this is the way we need to move in, in the future that the private sector um, enables and collaborates with the government system. And uh, recently, this uh, remote patient monitoring was, I think, yesterday or the year before, extended up to the 21 year olds. Eventually, it will be extended to the rest of insulin dependent diabetics. Um, so, um, these are examples of, of what we are working on. Um, of course, not, uh, I must not fail to mention um, that in the future, and this already has started, we need robotic applications where robotic surgery uh, for certain uh, particular fields of surgery um, needs um, to be set up here. Um, I think for prostate cancer, it is already set, set up. I'm, I'm not completely sure, um, but um, we are planning to extend these systems even further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gatt. I really wish to start wrapping up because I am aware that we are over time, but not before I ask the million dollar question and maybe um, we, we, we can have a round uh, reacting to this question. The fiscal sustainability of the healthcare system, I believe it was mentioned in the country specific recommendations. Uh, Mr. So maybe I can start with you. How, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to ensure the fiscal sustainability of our healthcare system? Well, uh, thank you uh, for this question. Yes, it is. Now, first of all, you have one has to look at uh, um, how government looks at uh, budget expenditure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, at the moment, uh, after an election, um, you know there there might be a number of uh, points that uh, crop up to my mind. But obviously, government has to decide on priorities. I agree that priority one is education and health. So we need to understand that financing, financing the education and health sectors are most important because without health, there is no economy. And I think, but one has to say exactly, you know, now that the new administration is being set up, parliament will start in, in two weeks time. So one has to see exactly, but I think education and health for me, are the priorities, have always been the priorities. And I think that government should look in these sectors very, very well and improve and um, stimulate these areas so that, you know, more, especially in the education, especially we can only improve our, our fiscality and, you know, the way that we live if we have better educated people, and hopefully that the gap that uh, Dr. Gatt mentioned, the, the, the highly qualified and the lowly qualified, will, will, you know, will, will come um, very close to each other because you know, having people who do, who do not know how to use computers, these are mostly the elderly, um, but you know, giving, giving, giving them like I did with my mother, giving her uh, a phone where she could talk to us and see us, that helped her. So I think, you know, small things could go, could go um, a long way. Thank you. Thank you for that. And also for your participation, <laughs> Mr. Tzad, you have another commitment. So thank you so much for being here. Maybe back to you, Dr. Gad, very, very concisely. I know it's a big question, with many different dimensions, but if you can sort of summarize it in just a couple of minutes, your thoughts? Uh, yes, I think um, uh, this is a very good question and that we constantly ask ourselves here and internally we discuss. Obviously, um, there could be ways of um, uh, how the government can collect money um, and then sort of as we practice the system here and redistribute it 
in, in, in a more equitable way. Um, obviously, it is important for the government to give the example of um, uh, creating contracts um, that are um, open and, and, and not liable to, to, to criticism. Um, so I'm not going into detail into that, um, but um, it is important that the country uh, collects all the, all the taxes it needs to collect and from everyone, right? But we need also to protect those people who are unable to work who, for some reason or other, and we need to protect those individuals who, because of one reason or another, um, are also uh, or have a very low <clears throat> income from day to day. So uh, th that is our responsibility. Uh, in terms of the Ministry for Health, uh, we need to, uh, in order to sustain health, uh, we need to spend our money uh, in, a, in a sensible way. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, for example, we have, in a way, problems that when, uh, let's go to the Mother Day Hospital, when we have um, lack of nursing staff, we ask our staff to do overtime. That becomes more expensive. So uh, in a way, we need to ensure that uh, we have sufficient staff um, to work with in our hospital. I think that's enough for me to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gatt, as well, for your participation. And uh, uh, Dr. Daguara, your, your, your final thoughts as well on this question on the fiscal sustainability of our health system. Well, when you look at it, I think health is always an increasing uh, expenditure. Year after year, uh, the prices will still keep on going up. Uh, with digitalization, with new technologies, with uh, new robotic interventions, um, any government will face an increased uh, expenditure into this, uh, this sector, uh, which I believe should be still well sustained uh, to have a healthy population. Uh, yes, I tend to agree that government has to look into uh, areas which will fund such a sector, um, irrespective, and also uh, regarding not only funding in the sense of equipment, but even in the workforce. Um, as was previously said, I think uh, Mata Day suffers from uh, workforce, uh, although maybe people who are working right now say, listen, it's better because we're doing overtime, so we're getting extra amount. Uh, it will come to bite us back. Uh, people will break down, people will have enough of it, and uh, even the quality of service uh, will, will, will keep on deteriorating in the sense that you can get someone to work 24-7, but then the productivity and the input he will be giving after a certain amount of time will, will dwindle, irrespective of the amount of uh, money you will pay that individual. Uh, so I think we have to really see why uh, we are having this problem with lack of uh, um, nursing staff, lack of uh, healthcare workers, uh, we have to see where they are shifting, whether they're going to any other country and why, if it is something that we can easily, uh, let's say, arrange from a government system, then I do see that we really need to go into that direction. Um, and I think hopefully like that, we should find uh, the, the solution uh, to the problem. The answer is not easy. There's no right and there's no wrong, but I think we have to stay on edge. Uh, see what's happening even in other countries around us and uh, uh, see how we can improve uh, to keep the, um, the very good professionals we have uh, at any level, which includes a, med a medical level, because obviously we're speaking about medical, to try and keep them on board and uh, both, I think, if we manage to keep them both work satisfied with a decent pay, then I think we won't have the issue of people uh, leaving or working on burnouts and, and whatnot. So. That's my view. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Dubois, also for your participation. I would also like to thank Laura Peters and her colleague, Ms. Hendricks, for uh, being here with us today, sharing their expertise on the topic. It was very uh, useful for us. Thank you. And uh, I will be wrapping up this webinar today. 
and also take the opportunity to inform that our next webinar will be tackling the topics of education and employment and like this webinar and the previous webinar as well it will be live streamed on our facebook page in may so thank you very much and i wish you a pleasant day ahead thank you thank you everyone thank you to all thank you thank you thank you